Hello and welcome to Shelly Carney Life Coach. It's our Friday happy hour chat and I'm your host Shelly Carney along with my bestie Toby Eunice. Today we're going to talk about active listening. How does it make you feel when somebody really listens to you? I believe you cannot move forward in any relationship unless both people feel they've been heard. Toby and I want to provide value to our community and we hope you enjoy the videos we create. We appreciate you being here to engage with us. To help us in return, you can share your ideas and appreciation by clicking on the thumbs up like button, subscribing, clicking on the bell to receive notifications, and writing a positive comment. Then share our videos with your family and friends so we can grow the channel and reach more wonderful people in the future. Thanks. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm Shelley Carney. I'm a podcasting and live streaming host, coach, and consultant, personal development expert, an interviewer, an author, a presenter, an introvert, and a nine on the Enneagram. <laughs> I always include that because it can son kind of sometimes inform you about a person's um, personality traits. And uh, we're going to focus a little bit today on interviewer, what it takes to be a good interviewer and to actively listen. Are you paying attention or actively listening? And what's the difference? Do you know the difference? Um, so I'd like to believe that actively listening it ensures that you're engaged in the conversation uh, as opposed to sometimes like you're sitting in class. Mm -hmm. When you're sitting in class it, it, you, and you have a recorder with you, a digital recorder, that's, that's uh, you know, participating in a kind of non-committed sense. Uh, you may not be ready to engage in the conversation. So if mm -hmm. you get called upon, for example, mm -hmm. the professor says, hey, uh, Toby, what exactly do I mean by a composite? You know, uh, And if you weren't actively listening, you were just kind of, you know. There. There. Uh, you may not get it, but if you're actively listening, you're engaged in your side of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, every once in a while, somebody will ask me, what do you find? Um, most interesting. What do you, what do you find most attractive uh, about a, a woman? And um, my response has always been, um, uh, I like the idea that she can hold up her end of the conversation. And part of that holding up your end of the conversation is actively listening. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, another way of looking at that when you brought up classes, taking classes, is if, for instance, I'm taking a training uh, with somebody if I am actively taking notes, even if it's just a, a recorded video, if I'm actively taking notes and planning on putting things into action that they're explaining to me, then I believe that's a more active uh, listening rather than a passive listening of just, you know, hearing what they say, but not planning to take action on it. But why should we listen? What is going to, what's in it for me if I listen to other people? Uh, we can build our relationships and deepen that bond. We can increase our empathy for others when we hear their side of the story. We enhance our own understanding and people understand us better. And uh, we can learn and develop knowledge. So if, if they tell me something and I don't know anything about, for instance, when Toby tells his stories about Vietnam that is not in in any way, anything that ever happened to me in my life, it's totally new. So listening to his stories informs me, educates me. I get to understand and learn about what it was like for a young man to be in Vietnam during the uh, conflict there. Uh, it helps us to solve problems. If we go in uh, already knowing that 
that guy's an idiot and um, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're not going to listen to him. We're not going to be able to solve the problem between us. If we come in with an open mind and truly actively listen, then we actually have a chance of solving that problem. And then we inspire positive feelings. When I am listened to, I feel like I'm validated. I, uh, I feel appreciated. I feel heard and acknowledged. And we can do that for the other person. And we back and forth raise our vibration together. So is this a good time to interject my sentient sales course? The whole course? No, no. Just to talk about what <laughs> sure, it was. Sure, go ahead. So uh, there was a period in time. If you time... want to go to full screen when, when you're talking, that would be good too. Okay. Let me do that. So there was a uh, period in time where when I was in Washington, D.C., I was helping other contractors learn how to sell to the federal government. And um, over over a period of about three or four years, I developed something called a sentient sales uh, course and sentient sales technique. And basically, the sentient sales technique said that if, when you went in to make a sale, uh, that you did as little talking as possible, that you just open, you asked open-ended questions and allowed your prospective customer to speak. And um, and not only did it work as a sales technique, it, I discovered uh, quite accidentally actually, that it worked as a relationship development technique. Uh, so you could uh, meet someone a, a, in a train station. You'd start talking, the more you listen to them, the more attached they become to you in kind of a, a, a pseudo emotional way, right? They just want to hear more of your uh, stories, yet you haven't told any of your stories. You've just asked questions about them. So uh, that's why I called it uh, sentient sales because it works on that side of the individual. The more you listen to an individual, the more they become kind of connected to you. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to tell your war stories. You don't have to tell your success stories. You don't have to do anything. You just have to ask them about that. And uh, the more you do that, the more connected they uh, become to you. That's right. People's favorite subject is themselves. Yeah. And that's what Dale Carnegie said in his book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm is the most popular person at the party that everybody likes so much is the one who just went around and asked everybody questions uh -huh. about themselves and yeah. then listened. So yeah. Dale Carnegie and there like that. Actually. Yeah. So next slide. Are you actively listening? Robert Baden Powell said, if you make listening and observation, your occupation, you will gain much more than you can by talk. That's a great quote. Yeah. I thought so. If you make listening and observation your occupation rather than sales or uh, live streaming, you know, mm -hmm. it's an interesting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a, a good quote. I like it. That's right. You can learn a lot. How to listen. So uh, we're going to go over these one by one, but let's, uh, this is what's coming up. We're going to talk about how to eliminate distractions. Uh, physical engagement, how to be physically engaged in the conversation, how to give reflective feedback, how to put aside judgment so you can uh, have an open conversation, and how to share similar experiences and why we want to do those things. So uh, this picture that you selected from Pexels, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because I've seen that young woman a lot. A lot, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. whoever that her, photographer is, her that's like... friend is a photographer. Yeah, yeah, apparently. But the other thing I just noticed is they're wearing exactly the same uh, coat, hmm. reflecting one another. That's I wonder true. if that was intentional. Yeah. Are you actively listening? Uh, Malcolm Forbes said, the art of conversation lies in listening. And if Malcolm Forbes says that, then you know it's pretty Good important. For me, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, these are you know these are people uh, who are highly regarded in their respective industries. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept the fact that they probably do a lot more listening and talking uh, as you know part of what made them successful. Exactly. Well, and part of a big part of leadership is being able to listen to the people around you mm -hmm. and take that information and put it to use. Mm -hmm. First, eliminate distractions. So as you can see, this young woman sitting at a table waiting to have that conversation. She doesn't have a phone or device out, so she's put away all her devices. Cleared her mind. She isn't um, trying to read the paper or study or look out the window and, 
and uh, she's cleared her mind. She's ready for a conversation. Uh, she has allowed the time necessary. Uh, when somebody wants to talk to you, make sure you ask them how long of a conversation would you like to have or how much time do you need? And then set that time aside so that you're not in a rush to uh, to get away uh, or you're distracted because you have another appointment coming up. Find a quiet space uh, so that you don't have a lot of noise interrupting your conversation and get comfortable, you know, use the bathroom, make sure you're not super hungry or super thirsty. Uh, be ready to be present. I was, uh, let me, I'm going to do this because you, I thought that was a good idea. I was um, uh, having a meeting with my good friend, Janet, mm -hmm. and uh, we were going to meet at um, uh, a local restaurant, one that's in Corrales, where, which is where we often meet. It's not a formal place. It's a very informal, casual restaurant. Uh, and uh, they're, um, they're, they've implemented social distancing things. So mm -hmm. you can't, the tables are not close to one another. So it really wasn't noisy, you know, as you uh, actually in comparison to how it usually is, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, I look back to, I look forward to going back to when it's just a noisy place, you know? <laughs> um, and as usual, I got there a little bit earlier and she was walking up and I saw her. And usually what I do is I ask her if she, she'd like some coffee or something to eat. So I put away my stuff. And the last thing that I was doing was I was putting away my phone. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, you don't have to put that away. And I said, yes, I do. This is your time. And uh, she just smiled and said, thank you. Uh, because we all know that the phone or the, the mobile phone has changed the manner in which we interact with others because we put it right there in front of us. Right. Um, it, it's uh, the, my, my phone has a setting that enables me to turn it over on its face. Mm -hmm. And it interprets that as don't bug me, you know. Don't leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear Do from you. Disturb. Do not disturb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that very handy mm -hmm. uh, because the last thing I want to do, I, I think it was Frank Sinatra that once, when asked once, um, uh, what, what, uh, I, I can't remember the question, but what is it that you don't do on a date? Uh -huh. uh, and his response was, you don't look at your watch and you don't yawn. <laughs> like that was his thing. Right. I added to that and you don't pick up your phone. Right. And if necessary, you put your phone in your pocket. So don't look at your watch. Don't yawn and leave your phone alone. Right. So it doesn't even have to be a date, just a conversation. And that's, that's just showing uh, respect and uh, caring for the other person. Yeah. Are you actively listening? M. Scott Peck said, you cannot truly listen to anyone and do anything else at the same time. So good thing to remember. Especially sometimes for parents, we need to think about that because our kids pick up cues from what we're doing. And if we're trying to be on the computer or um, play with our phones or a tablet or or doing something else, and they have something important to talk about, then it's time to put that to the side, at least for a few minutes, and just look at them and let them talk, because that's training them to do the same thing if you want to talk to them. If they grow up seeing you looking at a device or doing another job while they're trying to talk to you, then they'll get the idea that, oh, that's what uh, that's what humans do. That's what people do. That's what I should do. And then when they're a teenager and they won't listen to you because they're playing with their phone, you can uh, remember that you help to teach them that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind yeah. of your fault. Uh, well, and, and, you know, and I don't blame people because these things happen, but just keep it in mind. Slides? Yeah. Next is physical engagement. You want to face the speaker. Uh, this is really helpful to engage your body in whatever primary activity you are engaged in is face the speaker. That's going to put your body into the conversation. Eye contact. Look into their eyes as they're talking whenever possible. Lean in. When you're listening closely, uh, sometimes I even turn my head if I'm not hearing them uh, well, I turn my head to make sure that my ears can pick up all the sounds that are coming my way. Uh, nod and smile to let them know you are 
listening and paying attention to what they're saying and that you are encouraging them to continue with their talking. Uh, if you disengage suddenly, they might stop talking and wonder what's happening. Why did you look away? Or if you stopped nodding and smiling, they might think, uh, did I say something that upset you? You know, So continue to nod and smile if you want them to continue to talk. Voice your agreement by, mm-hmm, I, yeah. Mm hmm. You know, just to let them know you're there, especially if you're on the phone, you're going to want to do that because uh, they might think uh, nobody's there. Did my phone cut out if you're not making any sounds? Um, also, just that extra little bit of encouragement to keep them going and then touch people when appropriate, uh, mostly on the arm and uh, shoulder like this. Uh, would be good if you are having a conversation where you're giving them support, um, they're feeling sad or down in any way, that extra little physical touch can help them to feel more comfortable sharing uh, more openly. Peter Drucker said the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. Uh, body language makes up more than 80% of our communication. So that's one of the reasons you want to be very focused in looking at the person so you can even subconsciously pick up those facial cues that you might otherwise miss if you're looking away, putting something in between you. Um, it's like, for instance, if you're watching a television program, but you're also scrolling at the same time, you're going to miss a lot of the nuance of the program. I, I know that I've done that. You know, if I'm watching a program and suddenly I get a text and I start messing around with the text, I've totally forgotten everything that I just saw presented. So the same thing happens when we're having an interaction. You want to be looking at the person and in the moment so that you can pick up those cues that you might not have otherwise noticed if you were looking away. In uh, one of the schools that I attended uh, in my career, uh, there was a whole section on, do um, you want me to open up the screen here? Okay. <laughs> Don't mind me. Uh, there was a whole section on um, how to use a conversation with an individual as a complete exercise in intelligence gathering from uh, r recalling the making notes afterwards, recalling mm -hmm. the clothes they wore, wore, how they were sitting, how their face looked, what, what their expressions were, uh, not just what they were saying, how they were moving their hands, uh, whether or not they kept their hands in their pockets, right? Whether they smoked at, at the time, right? Uh, so it literally was uh, an exercise in collecting intelligence on the individual. And I brought that into the, the sentient sales uh, mm -hmm. technique as a, as a mega. I didn't call it collecting intelligence, basically analyzing the individual, going beyond just what you're hearing and using what you're seeing or even smelling. You could always, you know, when you walked into the office of someone who was a smoker, you, mm -hmm. could, you could smell that, you mm -hmm. know. And you wanted to make sure you didn't say anything offensive, even though you weren't a smoker. Um, so it was a complete analysis of the individual and an important part of this uh, uh, listening process uh, because it's absorbing a lot of other things, but not just what you're hearing. So, and, mm -hmm. and you have five senses, you know, so you might as well use as many of them as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned touch, mm -hmm. right? I don't expect that you're going to go up and taste them, but... <laughs> Maybe they could offer you a Tootsie Roll Pop or something. I don't know. Reflective feedback is next. Um, this is basically you're not listening to somebody so that you can formulate your reply or, or uh, what you would do in that situation or give advice. You're listening to understand. You're listening to learn. You're listening to get their information. And... In doing that, one of the one of the things we can do is offer that reflective feedback of repeating back what they've said 
paraphrasing, saying it in a different way. So what I'm hearing you say is this, is that correct? Check for clarification. Ask for those clarifying questions like, uh, I didn't understand uh, what you said there. You said you started work when you were 21, and what year was that? You can do those clarifying questions just to help you get that information straight in your mind, what they're talking about. Additionally, it's a great opportunity to empathize with somebody, and you could give them feedback such as, that must have been really hard, or um, I, I see what you're saying. I I hear that. Um, I I I can understand what you're talking about. Just that empathy without saying, I know exactly how you feel, because of course, nobody knows exactly how anybody feels except for themselves. Uh, but to empathize is just to give them that support that they're looking for so that they'll continue to speak. So one of the techniques that I've used in that case is when I can't empathize if I don't have a similar experience and I'm not able to empathize with the individual, I want to reflect back to them that although I can't empathize, you're telling your story in such a way that I can feel, you know, you're making me feel something, right? And, and, and it's not quite empathy, uh, but it is like, that's such a good story. You, you, you know, you touched in something inside of me. And I think that's a good way to reflect mm -hmm. when they've had an experience that you can't even imagine. You've just never had that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've noticed on Clubhouse uh, where people get up to tell their stories, some of them, I, I, it, I can't empathize. I, did, I don't, didn't lead that kind of life. Uh, but you think to yourself that that story is so well told uh, that you can see uh, how any how it changed them, how it made them better, and how they seem to have recovered from it. Then, and that creates a good good feeling. You know, the, a, a sense of good uh, uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. Ralph Nichols said, "The most basic of all human needs is to understand and be understood." The best way to understand people is to listen to them. Wow. Another great quote. Yeah. You want to go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Next, we want to talk about putting aside judgment. Uh, when you come into a conversation <laughs> already judging uh, the situation, uh, judging the person, judging their character, judging what they will probably say and what you will probably say. If you've got that mapped out in your mind, then you're not open to having an honest exchange of uh, information. You don't want to come into a conversation judging the person. And this happens a lot with uh, parents and kids. Um, I remember as my son got to be an adult, we had a conversation one day and I was kind of he was trying to make me feel guilty about something in, in sort of a passive aggressive way. And I said, I tell you what, from now on, when we have a conversation, I won't judge you and you don't judge me. And let's just go from here. And that, that really freed some things up for us uh, that he, when he wasn't feeling judged, he didn't feel the need to then judge other people. So, Judge not lest you be judged. <laughs> and when you come to a conversation without judging somebody or um, judging what they're going to say or maybe some action they took that was a mistake, well, if you can say, well, we all make mistakes and, you know, this is, this is where we go from here. Uh, trust can grow when you allow them to be themselves without feeling judged. Uh, your relationships can deepen. Your happiness increases because uh, you're open to receiving happiness and you're open to having a better relationship and they are happier that they're not being judged. Um, and then honesty comes easier when uh, you, you don't, when you know that you can come to that person and say, this and this and this happened and they just listen to you, and then they say, okay, and then what? Or I see, and and they're very neutral or even open to receiving what you're saying. Then you feel like, okay, I can be really honest with this person, and it improves your relationship. 
Very nice. Bryant H. McGill said, one of the most sincere forms of respect is actually listening to what another has to say. And I agree. Respect is um, super important, especially in marriage and partnerships. Uh, and that means, again, putting things aside and focusing on your partner when they're talking and um, giving them that respect. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like I listen to you enough? Yeah. <laughs> I'd let you know. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> Share similar experience. Um, you don't want to do this like too quickly. Let that person, ex you know, explain their entire experience before you jump in and say, oh, well, that happened to me or that happened to my brother. Um, because then you're sort of numb jumping into their story and taking it over. You don't want to hijack somebody's conversation, somebody's story. You want them to be able to tell their whole story. And then you can show understanding and empathy by saying, oh, I'm, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, something similar happened to me when I was that age and I made a mistake and I, you know, didn't do it any better than you did. So that would reduce their shame and guilt, knowing that you uh, accept them as they are. You're not judging them. You also had a similar experience and made similar decisions and similar mistakes. Then they feel like they are being understood. And it strengthens that bond and reinforces the learning. Uh, so for instance, this perhaps is a mother and daughter or grandmother and granddaughter. Um, if, uh, if one, if the younger one came to the older one and said, I, you know, had this bad thing happen, maybe the boyfriend broke up with her or whatever happened, something bad happened. And the, the, the mother or grandmother listened to her and then said, you know, um, when I was your age, something similar happened and here's how I handled it. And here's what I thought and felt and did. Then the younger one could learn from that and see maybe a path forward, whereas before they may have felt like, um, you know, life will never be better again. And when they hear, oh, they went through the same thing, and look at them now, they're doing great. So uh, we can have that that reinforcement of learning and uh, hope for the future. So I I actually have mixed emotions about this one, mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is. I feel like social media has had an impact on that kind of structure, you know? Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of bearing your soul on social media. And I know people who do, and I, it upsets me that they do not upsets. I'm not gonna, you know, I just, there's part of me that wants to say, don't, don't talk about that on social media. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons is one of the things that I've noticed about social media is when we're not together like this, where if, if I'm telling you something, you start empathizing or at least being aware of what I'm talking about, you can respond to it without saying, respond to it in a way that enables you to say, you know what, I went through that same experience. And um, not saying, oh, well, here's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I think one up you. Right. I think mm -hmm. that's what happens on social media. And because it's on social media, no one says, I went through a similar experience. Here's what I did. Right. Right. Hoping that they could reinforce that. And sometimes it doesn't do any good to do that. But and, and it's a lot easier to do when you're uh, face to face on social media. It's easier to say, really? Well, here's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, what did you call it? One up your store, do a mm -hmm. one up your store story level level up your story so that now your right. story becomes more important than whatever pain the person is experiencing right now again i'm not a big fan of bearing your soul on social media right if you have a problem call me yeah let's talk about it and i promise you what's not going to happen is i'm not going to one-up you yeah i'm going to share a i'm going to suggest that i had a similar experience and here's what i did if you're open to that advice right uh, so social media has an impact on this. Yeah, I, like I would save things like um, technical things, you know, like I was trying to learn how to do <clears> such <throat> and such and I bought this piece of software and it's not working and, and I need some help. That's great. That's great. Share that stuff on social media because right. people can 
can honestly help you with mm -hmm. things of that nature. But if it's something personal, like I'm going through a divorce or my kids on drugs or things of that nature, then you're going to want to talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody uh, that's a coach or a therapist or a best friend or a parent or a sibling or whatever. You're going to want to talk that through one-on-one. -on -one. Um, putting it, putting things out on social media is is good if you want advice. If you don't want advice, don't put it out there. <laughs> yeah, that's it basically. Yeah. So back to slides. Active listening marks you as a leader. As you saw uh, Malcolm Forbes and uh, some of the other names that we discussed, Peter Drucker, and they focus a lot on listening because when you listen to the people around you, you can take all their ideas and all their stories, combine them into uh, universal truths, and that can inform the way you live. Uh, it attracts others to you, right? We talked about Dale Carnegie, go to a party and ask everybody about them themselves, and they get to talk about themselves. They remember you as the person they like the most. Uh, it attracts people. Creates authority. When you listen to people, it gives you uh, the status of perhaps a coach or a mentor or uh, a parent or, you know, the person who is is the one that everybody comes to when they have problems. You are the guru, right? It gives you that authority. It demonstrates a growth mindset when you are open to listening without judging. You say, uh, well, I don't know anything about that. Why don't you why don't you share your experience with me? And you just let the person talk. That demonstrates that you're ready to listen and learn. It encourages others to share their story with you when you don't interrupt them, when you let them speak and you continue to encourage them with your body language. Uh, they will continue to flow with their story and you'll get to learn a lot more about them. And it offers that opportunity to learn. Again, you, they may have some bits of information that you didn't know anything about, and it could spark something in your mind that helps you in the future uh, to grow your business or have better relationships or whatever it is. So I am actively listening to your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, but I I regret the fact that we're not going to get the opportunity to discuss how well drawn that paramecium on the whiteboard is. <laughs> well, as you can see, that teacher is listening to that student. <laughs> uh, so I have a free gift for you for watching today's video. It's um, all about doing conducting interviews since we're talking today about being an active listener and working on your listening skills, one of the great ways to practice listening is by interviewing others. Uh, so this is an excellent companion to this presentation. It's, it's an ebook. It's your free gift, and it teaches you to master the art of successful interviewing. And that link for this ebook is in the description box of the video. Oh, great! Yeah, that was that was. I got to tell you that. Um, this is the result of the fact that Shelly and I did a presentation on uh, um, interviewing top 10 interview uh, uh, tips on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And between Tuesday and today, Shelly took that and uh, transcribed it. It's not an exact transcription, but took the best out of that presentation and turned it into a download. So I strongly recommend that you download this. And I know at the end, she probably put a link to that presentation. I did to not. The, oh, okay. I put a different link. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. <laughs> put a link for them to contact us oh, okay. so that uh, they can learn more. No, that makes sense. Um, uh, so yeah, that link is in the description box below. Yeah. Active listeners are great podcast hosts. So if you want to be a great podcast host, you want to practice your listening skills and your interview skills. They're dynamic interviewers, meaning they uh, hold up their end of the conversation so that it's not just the interview guest who's doing all the talking. They are giving that extra um, filling, uh, fulfilling material that, uh -huh. that keeps it 
uh, flowing like a conversation. They are inspired writers because when you listen to others, you're able to write from different viewpoints. Uh, you can be much more creative in your writing. They're productive team members because they listen to what their role is and what their goals are, and they act on that uh, information because they've listened well. And they're highly paid coaches because a coach is uh, very much about listening and asking questions and getting more information and getting that uh, person to talk so that they can pull out the answers themselves and uh, that conversation is the tool for doing that. So I'm going to leave this slide up rather than opening up because I have a comment to make on it. And and that is um, when I was in, uh, in in my career in Washington, one of the things that people would hire me to do is write white papers and case studies for them because white papers and case studies were the marketing tools that some of these high-tech companies that were marketing to the government required. And everyone perceived them as really difficult to do. Like it would take them months to do it. And the reputation I had was that I could go from zero to having a completely published white paper in 30 days, which may sound like a lot, but when you're talking about the technical level white papers that the, the government expected. Um, and the, my routine for that was to ask them to give me uh, 10 people that worked on the project team. Uh, and make it a variety of people from leaders to line workers to implementers, et cetera. And basically I would interview them as if I was, they were on my podcast, not that there were podcasts back mm -hmm. then. Um, but it was that conversation um, because I'd record every one of them. I would have them transcribed and it was m my conversation with them, the, the interaction between them and me uh, and the transcript that was the basis for creating the white paper. And it was that the white paper wasn't just a set of quotes from them. It was actually a storyline that came from the transcript. And, uh, you know, I would add where I needed to. But the, the important thing about that was you could not do that if you were not actively listening mm. to uh, the individual and what they were talking about, not only for the purpose, because I, I knew the, the, the 10 questions that I would want to ask each of these individuals, uh, but I also knew that they were going to say something that was going to cause me to ask another question. And the reason I recorded them uh, and usually if I could, I'd record them on a video camera. Mm -hmm. And this was back in the days where we used tape, you know, videotape. Mm -hmm. um, because what it enabled me to do was not worry about making notes. Mm -hmm. And the less time I can spend making notes and paying attention to them, the more valuable that is to me. Uh, so if they allowed me to record them, and uh, literally I don't ever recall somebody saying no, you know, I don't want, uh, are we going to do this on camera? Yes, we're going to do this on camera. It's for my purposes, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes my job easier. They all, all say yes. But it was so that I could see them, not just hear them, uh, and not interrupt myself making notes. I, I literally uh, have, you know, you know me in my notebooks. Mm -hmm. That was a period in time where I did not fill notebooks with these conversations. I just watched and listened and asked questions. And it, it was an amazing experience. And uh, it's something uh, that uh, became a skill, you know, that you can take into uh, whatever you're doing in the future. So like us now. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's right. So I invite you to connect with us and uh, schedule a free consulting call to define your social media goals assess your specific needs, clarify your best options. These are our links, which are also in the description box below the video, messagesandmethods.com, shellycarney.com, tunis.com. Those have all of our links. Those are just our pages with our links so that you can choose what you want to do or what method you want to use to reach out when you get there. Um, if you want to email or if you want to call or text or write to us or whatever it is you prefer to do. Uh, reach out on social media, however you like to uh, connect. And uh, we hope that you'll do that. And um, as we mentioned earlier, you've got that uh, ebook that Shelly's offering you. Make sure you go pull that down. And then once you've gone through the ebook, go back and uh, follow uh, the links that Shelly has set up for you in that ebook to get more information. So, so here's something nice for you, Brian says. 
Well, thank you, Brian, for being here. And please do share with your family and friends. So, okay. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate you and we hope that you got something valuable from this conversation. And uh, we will be back tonight at seven o'clock for AGK Gaming. And again next week for the podcasting and live streaming channel. And if you missed last Tuesday, go back and watch that because we do give those 10 interviewing tips through video. So check that out as well. Thanks for being here and for Shelly Carney Life Coach. Um, happy hour on Friday. I am your host, Shelly Carney. I will see you guys. Uh, my name is Toby Yunus. I'm her co host. I'm her <laughs> button pusher. I handle all the technology here, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will see you tonight on EGK Gaming. We we'll look forward to that. We'll have a lot of fun. We'll start with some drawful and end up in Among Us. Yeah.